And as you can see right there, you've got uh, the ET arriving from Louisiana. It basically is taken from Louisiana to Cape Canaveral via the Freedom Star, which is one of our booster recovery ships. And then a tug uh, takes it up the canal, up to the dock you see there. And then the, the external tank is, is rolled off of the, uh, the barge and then takes a, a short half mile trip over the VAB. And uh, as far as with the VAB itself, since I got a few minutes here, uh, the, it's a, quite a building, 525 feet tall, floor space of about eight acres. And you can see the uh, external tank there and the three parts of that external tank. The, the pointy piece there is the LOX tank. The lower part is the LH2 tank. And there you can see the composite nose cap of the external tank. And then in between those two tanks is the inner tank. And you can see that that's the, the considered like the structural uh, component of the external tank. Some people call that part of the external tank the backbone. And you can see there, um, now that it's in the cell, with the umbilicals um, that, that feed the LH2 and the locks um, into the main engines, into the main propulsion system. You can see uh, Scotty um, sitting there, uh, Scotty Dorton, one of our more experienced technicians, watching the external tank being lifted out of the cell. The tank itself is quite remarkable in its own right. It's 154 feet tall, 27 and a half foot diameter holds 500,000 gallons of propellant for the main engines. Empty, it's only 58,000 pounds because it's very just a, a lithium, uh, aluminum lithium uh, structure, very thin. But once it's loaded up, it weighs uh, over one and a half million pounds. So again, uh, quite a remarkable piece there. You can see as it's being lifted out of the cell, eventually uh, taken across over to the integration cell on the other side of the, the vehicle assembly building where it's taken in between those two solid rocket boosters. There's a, a attach points um, up at the forward end and also at the lower part as well. And you can see the umbilicals now, now coming into view um, where one of the attach points is to the orbiter. And you can see a technicians closely monitoring um, the tank as it's coming in between the boosters. There's a lot of very tight clearances on the external tank as they're, they're lowering it into position. You can see the LOX feed line uh, going up there. Um, there on the right hand side, technicians again uh, looking at it. The, the foam itself, um, the tank is covered with foam, about an inch of foam in most of the areas to, to keep, the, keep, it, keep any ice forming there. And while they're doing all the processing over in the VAB, they're also processing over the orbiter processing facility. And you can see there the, the main engines being installed. The main engines have to be removed and refurbished every flow. And then you can see them here going into the aft compartment and working some of the installation there on the orbiter. Quick view there of uh, the payload uh, bay area. Um, and then after a, a good three and a half, four months of processing, the orbiter was being rolled out of the orbiter processing facility. Uh, you can see the orbiter rolling over. It's, uh, um, you can see on the underside of the orbiter, there's um, on the order of 25,000 tile on the underside of the orbiter. Quite a bit of work was done in over in the orbiter processing facility. Uh, they had uh, a lot of good uh, modifications made as far as um, putting in some um, uh, harder tile up and around some of the critical areas on the underside of the orbiter. I'm um, at the nose landing gear and the, uh, the main landing gear areas. And uh, you can see now that the orbiter is actually being lifted off the transporter. Um, there's two cranes that do that. There's a 325-ton crane and a 175-ton crane. They lift it up, as you can see, the transporter rolled out of the way, and then the vehicle is, is rotated to a vertical position. One of the cranes is disconnected, and then you have the 325-ton crane actually going up and then starting to, to lift that in to um, the integration cell um, so that they can mate that to the external tank. The orbiter itself is uh, 122 feet tall, 78 foot wingspan and you can see there they actually have to rotate the orbiter somewhat to be able to get it over that transom. The weight of the orbiter is 200,000 pounds. Probably a good point here to mention the fact that STS-123 is the 122nd flight uh, of the shuttle. Uh, Endeavour's 21st into space and the 25th uh, flight to the uh, space station. You can see it there in the integration cell uh, being Mounted. There's a, a forward location where they, they mount uh, the bipod struts and then the aft area as well. Now, after seven days of checkout um, in the VAB, uh, making sure everything works fine, um, then the crawl to transporter 
comes up underneath the mobile launcher platform and then they lift, uh, lift it up and then start to, to make the slow trip over to uh, pad A. Kind of interesting about the transporter is that it, uh, up on the surface there, it's 131 feet long, 114 feet wide. It can, uh, about the size of a regulation baseball field. And the crawler transporter itself weighs uh, 6 million pounds. It gets 150 gallons of diesel fuel per mile. So it's not the best gas mileage in the world, but it does get the, the job done. And uh, the trip itself, uh, it's only four miles, um, but it takes about seven and a half hours to actually get to the pad surface. They go about 0.8 miles an hour. And uh, 22 days of checkout and a lot of work uh, done at the pad, uh, and then they're ready to launch.